afternoon, everyone, and welcome to a Project Tier webinar featuring Professor Dorothy Bishop. I'm Morten Ann Gernsbacher, Vila's Research Professor and Sir Frederick Bartlett Professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I'm delighted to be moderating today's session. Today's presentation is one of several weekly webcasts that feature leaders in the transparency and reproducibility movement. As a former TIER fellow, I'm grateful to the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for their generous sponsorship and continued support of Project TIER, including today's webinar. In case you experience audio or video difficulties during the broadcast, please know that we will be recording today's session and posting it to the Project Tier website for later viewing. And now to introduce our honored speaker and my longtime friend, Professor Dorothy Bishop. Dorothy Bishop is Professor of Developmental Neuropsychology at the University of Oxford, where she heads an ERC-funded program of research into brain lateralization. She is a supernumerary fellow of St. John's College, Oxford. Her main research interests are in the nature and causes of developmental language impairments, with a particular focus on psycholinguistics, neurobiology, and genetics. She actively contributes to open science and research reproducibility, and in 2015, she chaired a symposium by the Academy of Medical Sciences on reproducibility and reliability of biomedical research. She chairs the advisory board of the UK Reproducibility Network and is a founder, founding member of Reproducible Research Oxford. She's also quite active on social media with a popular blog, Bishop blog, and she tweets at DVB. Today's presentation is titled, Why Scientific Reasoning is Hard, The Role of Cognitive Constraints in Biasing Our Reasoning. Professor Bishop will present for approximately 45 minutes, after which we'll have a few minutes for questions. Throughout the presentation, feel free to type your questions into the Q&A panel on Zoom. So, with no further ado, let me turn the broadcast over to Professor Bishop. Thank you very much, Morten Ann. And it, it, I'm delighted that this uh, occasion is a good occasion for us to get together after many years. <laughs> um, I'm going to try and share my screen um, so you can see my slides. Uh, here we go. And, yep, I, I trust that that is now visible. And um, what I'm going to be focusing on today is perhaps a bit different from some of the other talks you've had in this series, because I think a lot of the other speakers are particularly interested in computational reproducibility, which is this really important thing that I know the Project Tier people are, are very good at running training on and so on. As a psychologist, I'm interested in this other sort of reliability, replicability, which is the whole business of if you do a study, can you actually get the same result if you try to do it again using the described version that has been published. So it, it's not necessarily that you're having, you, obviously you would also want to be able to reproduce the script and uh, the results, uh, get them out of the data in the same way. Uh, but ideally what you're trying to say is that things are generalizable to a, another study done the same way. And reasons why this doesn't occur have been started to really worry people. And Morton Ann mentioned this symposium that I chaired in 2015 with the Academy of Medical Sciences, um, who ran it in conjunction with some of our big funders in the UK. So we had the Medical Research Council, the BBSRC, that's Biology and Biotechnology Research Council, and the Wellcome Trust, all of whom were getting pretty concerned about the fact that people were beginning to argue that biomedical studies were not necessarily uh, very replicable. And you had people from, for example, pharmaceutical companies saying that they were trying to build on the results of some of these uh, findings only to discover that they just couldn't get the same results a second time. And we realized in the course of this very interesting symposium that went on for a couple of days and we had all sorts of evidence from different people that there's no one problem. Um, there's all sorts of different things that were going on that led to this overall um, 
crisis really in, in the science, the reproducibility of the science, including um, problems with design, problems with underspecified methods, many, many things. I won't go into them all here. Um, and we felt in terms of trying to solve these problems, that we had to really adopt both a top down and a bottom up approach because part of the difficulty was top down in the sense that the, the incentive structure that was set by institutions, by funders, by journals was really encouraging often bad science. Um, and on the other hand, there was also the need for bottom up change in that it was clear that people were not always aware of the problems that they were, they were committing. And there was a general lack of training in statistics and methods. And so since that symposium, I've been very active in trying to see how we can address this, these, this pair of problems um, in future ways, both by changing incentives and by changing training. But the more I've really looked at it, the more I've started to think there's another thing that we need to worry about, which as a psychologist is something that I'm actually dead interested in, which is the cognitive biases that we all have, which I think make it particularly hard for us to overcome some of these issues. Um, so that it's not just that we don't know how to do good science or that we're misincentivized. It's that quite often we really find it quite goes against our natural grain of how we think and reason uh, to do science in the rather objective uh, way that we are supposed to do it in. And I'm going to talk today about um, a few of these biases. I think there's more than this, but the ones that interest me in particular is, first of all, just the huge difficulty that most people have in really understanding probability. And given that for many types of statistical analysis, people do rely on p-values, and I know there's a debate about whether we should be using that sort of uh, null hypothesis significance testing, but if you do, uh, you do use p-values, and um, they are often misinterpreted in ways that mean that we often generate a lot of false positives, I think, in what we're doing. And I'll say a bit about that. Um, then it also, we make the opposite error. We actually, by failing to really appreciate particularly the need for large samples in many of the things we're doing, we have often, we're missing out on, on effects that are true. So we have false negatives, we have the double whammy. So that's one problem I'll spend a bit of time on. Then also, um, there's a whole business of what is known as confirmation bias, which means that we selectively tend to attend to and we selectively remember things that fit with our preconceptions. Um, and that has a huge impact, I'm going to argue, in leading us to believe that things are really solid, replicable findings, when quite often they're not. And I think we're slowly realizing that by taking a step back and trying to really evaluate reproducibility of various findings. And the other thing that comes into this is, in fact, morality and ethics, because one of the reasons people keep doing things, even though perhaps statisticians have said they shouldn't, is that they just don't appreciate that the problems are leading to ethical difficulties. So let me start, though, with the errors of statistical reasoning and the failure to understand p-values. I'm showing you here one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, because I like the idea that we can start talking about some of these problems as the various horsemen of the apocalypse and p-hacking is one of them and I think this guy looks as if he's having a very good hack at some p-values. Um, let me try and explain this um, simply using poker and I know that um, not everybody plays cards uh, but this is not a terribly complicated idea and the benefit of card games is that it was really because people were gambling and using cards that they started to really analyze and understand uh, probability because it's, it's very key to being a good card player to understand probabilities. But let's suppose um, you're playing poker and you have a five um, card hand and you have what's known as three of a kind. So you've got here three queens, but getting three of the same card uh, whether it's a queen or a four or three, it doesn't matter. The probability that at least three of your cards will be the same is about one in 50. This has all been worked out by uh, card sharps. So if I then say, suppose I've got a friend uh, who's a magician and he can alter how you think to affect how the cards fall and you have an unbiased uh, deck of cards and he says he's going to think very hard and when you deal your five cards, you'll get three of a kind. 
And you do that and it works, you get three of a kind. You'd be really impressed, I think, um, because you'd realize that for this to happen without him having some influence on you would be rather unlikely, it would only be one in 50 occasions. On the other hand though, suppose you then discovered that he'd actually gone around and tried his trick on 50 people and dealt 50 hands or they got them to deal their own hands and only one of them had actually worked and was a three of a kind, you wouldn't be impressed. You'd think, well, you know, of course he gets one that worked out in 50. So it's the key point really of p-hacking is that you cannot interpret the probability without understanding the context in which it was worked out. So if you have just a single um, hand of cards and you get this unusual sort of hand, uh, you'll think, well, that's, that's unexpected. But if you deal loads and loads of hands of cards and one of them comes out in this unusual way, it's, you realise it's not particularly improbable. And so you have to take into account the context and not just interpret a p-value as meaning something on its own uh, without the context. Um, so this is the key error, is that a lot of people, when they analyse their data, they're looking for the significant p-values. They're desperately trying to find something that's P less than 0.05 and if they find that they think that's a meaningful important result but it's not if it's picked up in a context where you could easily have found that in the context of looking for many other things and here's just another way of trying to explain it in a more scientific uh, example where you might have a large population database and you're exploring the link between, for example, I'm interested in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and handedness, do they two go together? And I've got a nice big sample and I look in it and to my uh, sorrow, I find that it's not a significant result. Um, and uh, it's the p-value is much bigger than 0.05. So I think, well, nevertheless, if I start looking at just the younger children, it starts to look a bit more promising. It's nudging towards significance. Um, but what I have to then appreciate is that even at just doing my data, splitting it up into two groups like this, P is less than 0.05 is no longer something that only occurs in one on 20 occasions, because I really would have been interested in either older children or younger children. And I'm only just focusing on the younger ones because it looks good. Um, but really, I need to take into account the likelihood of that either of those two results would be significant in terms of that P value. And that is much higher. So you have to make a distinction between whether I have predicted this particular association down this particular forking path with the young children or whether I was just interested in anything coming out. And you can continue this and you can say, well, maybe I had two different tests of handedness, a skill measure and a preference measure. And I found the skill measure was looking better. So I, I stick with that. And uh, then I think, well, it's particularly strong in girls. So I've got females. And as you see, as I go more and more down, selecting from my data the things that look most important, I'm actually ignoring all these other terminal points, but I, I'm getting larger and larger numbers of comparisons that I could have done. And we get to the end where I've decided that I'm interested in children who are girls who are living in an urban environment on a skill measure and who are young. And lo and behold, I rejoice because I've got P is less than 0.05 and I think, oh, I've got a publishable result. But by this point, potentially, I could have looked at 16 different uh, sub subdivisions of the data and the likelihood that at least one of those is actually reaching P less than 0.05 is 0.56. So I've got a very good chance of finding something. And unfortunately, people do this all the time and don't really realise it's wrong. And they will often do it not then deciding, deciding that they won't even talk about perhaps the older children. So they'll delete an entire set of paths from one place because that doesn't look so exciting. But this is how you manage to get false positive results very easily because you're just basically this is p-hacking. So the key point to appreciate is that p-values are only interpretable in terms of the context. And you have to consider whether you actually uh, had a hypothesis that constrained the things that you're looking at that you had specified before you saw the data, or whether you're only sort of trying to invent a hypothesis having looked at the data, which is not a valid thing to be doing, but which is very often done. So the, if you want to try and remember it, think back to the magician. It makes a huge difference whether he's tried his trick on 50 people and only succeeded once, or whether he's tried it just once and lo and behold, it's come out. That's the difference between him like having a hypothesis a priori of one particular result he should get, 
or just p hacking through his data. So the rarity of that particular hand of the magician uh, is, doesn't change, but the context in which he found it does. This is just one way in which people can get um, false positive results very easily, uh, dividing your data up into subgroups. There's also data dredging from large sets of variables. This is enormously common in some areas of science and people are often not trained to realize it's a problem. There's also trying different analysis approaches until one just sort of works um, or doing very complicated multi-way ANOVAs or multiple regressions with a lot of main effects and interactions in them and not adjusting. You can adjust for this uh, large number of comparisons, but if you don't, you're going to get false positives. Um, there's a very famous and wonderful example um, in the literature um, by Richard Pito, um, who was doing the statistical analysis for a very large trial of a drug treatment um, with huge numbers of patients, which he wanted to publish in The Lancet, a very prestigious journal. And they published it, they sent in their paper, and the reviewers said, well, you really should do some subgroup analysis. You know, perhaps you should look at younger people or older people or males or females. And Peter stood firm and said, no, we didn't predict anything there. So if we start doing that, we're going to bias our results. But they persisted and said, he really should look at subgroups. Um, so he got his own way by saying, okay, I'll publish subgroups. And he did a subdivision into astrological signs. And this is actually written up in the Lancet that subdivision of the patients with respect to their astrological birth signs indicates that for patients born under Gemini or Libra, there was a slightly adverse effect of aspirin on mortality. So this was a beautiful way of sort of pointing out to the editors and the reviewers just how easily you could find something if you did divided up your data by sort of showing that it works when you do something that none of them are really going to believe in. Just have a sip of tea. I'm beginning to get so excited. I'm losing my voice. Right. So that's one example. Here's another one that um, I was recently asked to comment on for the science media, which uh, Science Media Centre, which in the UK um, gives journalists uh, brief um, opinions on papers that are being um, coming out uh, with press releases. <clears throat> and this was a paper that was um, arguing that there were environmental exposures that led to autism spectrum disorders. And um, the point about this study, and you don't need to read all this slide, but it looked at exposure to uh, the parents before the child was born um, to 16 agents and uh, was interested in things um, like, um, among other things, solvents, but um, all sorts of different types of um, factors like exposure to radiation or exposure to petrol. You know, there were various things that they were looking at. And at the end of the day, they concluded that the odds ratio, that's the OR there, uh, of children of mothers exposed to any solvents was 1.5 times higher than the mothers of, of typically developing children. Um, and this is in the abstract of the paper. But if you actually looked at the body of the paper, you found that they ran their analyses on 16 different agents for mothers, for fathers, or for whether either mother or father had been exposed. They used binary analyses in just dividing children up into affected and unaffected, or you, uh, exposed or unexposed, and then more continuous models where they looked at the range of exposure. And if you do the sums, you can see that they did 96 different analyses. Um, now, if the, these were independent of each other, then the probability of at least one of those analyses showing a value below, uh, below 0 0.05, a p-value below 0 0.05, is actually one minus the probability that none of the analyses is significant. And you can do the maths and work out that it's actually like 0.99. So the odds of them not finding anything in their 96 analyses is incredibly low. Um, it's possible that that's an overcorrection if some of these uh, different analyses are correlated, but nevertheless, you, can, you should be able to do your analyses correcting for all of this. And indeed they did. Um, and in the body of the paper, they say, well, the corrected p-values um, were non-significant and it was only if you used the uncorrected p-values that you got significance. But then they forget about it. And I often find that people say this, they, and you get papers written up where they say, well, the result didn't survive the Bonferroni correction and make it sound as if it's sort of an um, unfortunate accident that it somehow died. But the fact of the matter is you're just kidding yourself if you think a, a, a single uncorrected p-value 
in a situation like this is meaningful. Let me turn to another type of error of statistical reasoning, uh, which is having the opposite effect on whether or not uh, you see a significant result. And that is the tendency to not appreciate how um, the variability of the estimates that you see when you are measuring something or taking a sample and looking, for example, at the mean, how far the variability really depends uh, on the sample size and is particularly adversely affected in small sample sizes. And therefore you can get actually the opposite problem, which is the false negative. You can have a genuine effect in your data, which you fail to find because your the estimate is just too noisy. There's a, just a lot of variability there that there's nothing to do with the effect of interest. And this is how most people do experiments is that they often don't actually think very hard about this issue of statistical power. They have a bright idea, they collect some data, they get the data in and start thinking how to analyze it, and then they hit problems typically, and then they go and talk to a statistician. And more often than not, the statistician says, I'm afraid that your data are hopeless. And this was a point that was made by Ronald Fisher back in the uh, last, um, well, in, the, in fact, the 19th century, no, last century, he made this uh, statement that to consult the statistician after an experiment is finished is often merely to ask him to conduct a post-mortem examination and he can perhaps say what the experiment died of. And what the experiment very often dies of is low power, which is another of these horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, of the reproducibility apocalypse. And low power means you just haven't got a big enough sample size to see the effect of interest. Um, now, people really get irritated with statisticians telling them that their studies are underpowered because quite often it's very hard to get large samples and it may be impossible to do so without joining forces, for example, with other research groups, in, especially if you're looking at clinical samples and so on. But the point that you need to understand is that it can be just a complete waste of time, effort and money doing a study that's underpowered because it's not going to show you anything. And I've found that the best way to get people to appreciate this is not to get them to read statistical books about power, but rather to simulate data. Because I think then you generate, you can generate a set of data where you know um, what truth is, because when you simulate data, in effect, you act like God. You are um, able to create a data set that you either know there's a real effect or there's no real effect. And then you can run your statistics on your simulated data. And quite often you'll find that the result you get is not uh, what you might have expected. So when you, I, and I have at the end of my talk some uh, links to some slides I've got that go into more detail about how you simulate data. It's not as difficult as many people think it might be. But the idea is that you just say, well, um, anything that you're measuring, you can regard as a combination of a genuine effect of interest plus some random noise. So if, for example, I'm simulating the effect of an intervention on children's reading, for example, does it actually work or not? I can simulate a, a load of noise and then I can do that for two different groups. And then in one group, I'll just add an extra um, average value to all the data points I've simulated. And then you get these sorts of distributions like you see here, um, these, these two little charts showing all the individual data points. Now, the goal of research, of course, is to find out whether there's an effect of interest and if there is, how big is it? Um, and the classic sort of hypothesis testing with p-values really just focuses on, is there an effect of interest? In other words, you're really just asking, are the data compatible with there just being noise or is there a real effect? So if you simulate there's some data in this way I've described, the sorts of things you get are distributions like this. So this is just 10 runs of a simulation of 20 people per group where there's an effect size of 0.5 of a standard deviation. So that means the difference between the means of these two groups in the population that they're drawn from. So you simulate a great big population where there's a genuine difference of half a standard deviation in the means. And then you're taking repeated samples of just 20 people in two groups uh, and then running your t-test or whatever. And what you see here, of course, uh, is a bit sobering because I have generated, generated data from this known distribution where there really is 
an effect that's by the standards of um, interventions for reading is quite a big effect. Um, 0.5 um, and yet you see that there's actually only three of these uh, runs where it is statistically significant and in some of these runs such as there's one here um, down on the bottom left where it actually looks as if they're absolutely identical even though they're drawn from a population where there's a true difference so it's this getting this understanding of how sampling from a population and taking a small sample is going to not necessarily show the effect that's there in the big sample it's drawn from is, is something you really have to get an intuitive appreciation of if you're going to do your studies and plan them properly with the adequate sample size. Um, in, normally when you simulate data you'd simulate thousands of runs and then you can actually just work out the uh, probability of getting different sorts of effect sizes from all those simulations but this is a very sobering demonstration and i find that if you teach students statistics this way they really start to understand why power is important if you take 10 runs with 100 per group things are looking much much better with an effect size of 0.5 you normally will see that effect if you've got 100 per group um, but if you've got a smaller effect size even with 100 per group you often um, will realize that you, you won't necessarily see it. And if you think of the effect sizes that often uh, scientists are interested in, they aren't that big and you do need very large samples to be fairly confident that you're going to, your experiment will be able to show them. <clears throat> so this leads me to argue that a much better way to do experiments and one that may overcome some of these cognitive biases is that before you actually start rushing off and gathering your data, you start simulating some data to think, what would the data look like if I ran this study? And obviously you have to make some assumptions about things like how big the effect is and so on. But you can then simulate this population of data and then you think about how you're going to analyze it. But that will often make you aware of how big a sample you're really going to need. And if you do run into problems, you may be able to take advice from a statistician before you're committed to collecting real data with all the expense that that entails. Now I'm going to move on now um, to this other bias that I think is very important, which is known as confirmation bias. Um, and confirmation bias doesn't just affect scientists, it affects all of us all the time. It's, it is a human characteristic and it's often a rather useful characteristic. This is the thing about a lot of these biases that we have is that in the real world, it's often sensible not to be surprised by everything that occurs to you, but to sort of expect certain things will happen and then pay attention um, to things that are consistent with your, your preconceptions. So the interesting thing though is that confirmation bias has this rather killing effect in scientific context in that it tends to mean that we are only interested for instance in the results that agree with what we wanted to find. So suppose we go back to these data that come from the um, runs of the simulation where we've got just 20 per group for the effect size of 0.5 um, and we imagine now that maybe these are t 10 different scientists doing these studies, um, you can immediately think to yourself, well, how, which of these results are actually going to get published? And the answer is going to be pretty much mostly the ones that are statistically significant. Um, and this is for two reasons. One is the scientists themselves will probably regard the other results as failed experiments and lose interest in them and decide to put them in the final drawer. Um, but also if they don't and they try and publish this in a journal, the journal will probably reject them as uninteresting and indeed may point out that these, this is a rather underpowered study. But if they get the result that looks interesting, like the ones with the little red stars, the journal may no longer worry about power and think, oh, this is an exciting sort of result and they will publish it. And there's numerous examples of this happening. So this is another horseman of the apocalypse, in fact, publication bias. Now, to give you an idea of how this then plays out, I'm going to see whether I, uh, my audience here now are going to be able to participate in a little poll, a sort of thought experiment, because what I'm going to say is that we're going to have some results um, from a series of experiments that are testing a treatment. Let's say it is my favorite intervention for children's reading. And I don't know whether it's going to work or not. At the outset, I've got to think it's got a 50-50 chance of being effective. <clears throat> 
And I run some studies where I use a traditional alpha 0.05, and I've got well, a well-powered study. I've got at least a power of 0.8. So I've got a big enough sample to see the true effect if it's there uh, on 80% of, of runs of my study. And then there's six studies, and the first one works, the next one doesn't. So this one, naught, one, one, naught, one is really, the ones are when the treatment is better than the control and statistically significant, and the noughts are when it's not. So the question I want people to consider is, how confident would you be that this treatment is effective? And you know, maybe we want to roll it out in our local schools and so on. So, so would you think that would be something to, to do? Um, and you can either say, yes, the treatment is very likely to be ineffective, or it's maybe effective, but you're not quite certain, or it's very likely to be effective. And um, I'd love to pe for people to have a go at uh, responding to that, if there's anybody there <laughs> voting, um, because we can then see whether you're right or not. Right, so we've got 20% um, think ineffective, um, then 80% may be effective but unclear, and nobody thinks it's very likely to be effective, which is actually very interesting because, um, let me, I've got to get back to my screen, it's actually very likely to be effective. Um, this is because it's 80% powered, apart from anything else, so it's got a good chance um, of, of showing the effect, but the what you can do is work out the log odds of there being a true effect. And every time you get a null result, they go down. And every time you get a positive result, they go up. And this will depend on both the alpha you pick and the power. And this is a log scale, but the general view is that if it goes above about four log odds, the likelihood is that it really does work. So this is actually would be regarded as three studies turning out. Remember that if it doesn't work at all, it's got a 95% chance of, of coming up as zero. So um, what you've got here is, is, is quite strong evidence. But let's now look at another situation where we've got um, a rather worse looking performance where we've got a, a positive trial and then three negative ones and a positive one, a couple of negative ones and a positive one and three negative ones. Again, with the same power and alpha. Could we have another poll here on this? We've got some results on this one. Right, interesting. So very likely to be ineffective, 33%. Lots of people sitting still on the fence and nobody thinks it's very likely to be effective. Um, and in fact, if again you do the same sort of likelihood analysis, um, it's actually very likely to be ineffective. It goes down in the other direction, down to minus four in terms of the likelihood calculation. Now, the thing that I haven't told you, and some of you may have spotted, is that the sequence of this second run is exactly the same as the sequence of the first run with extra zeros inserted in it. Now, this is really trying to get across the idea that it's really important that publication bias distorts our, our understanding massively, because if about two thirds of the negative trials never see the light of day, you will get the impression that you've got a highly effective uh, intervention, although many of the audience here didn't think it was that effective, but in fact, that's quite good evidence. Whereas if the truth is known, it becomes much more obvious that it really isn't that effective. And so this is the way publication bias can really mislead you. And I got the idea for making these sorts of uh, graphs from this very fine paper by um, Nissen and colleagues, which was published in eLife, uh, just a few years ago, where they were simulating exactly these sorts of things happening and showing how they produced what they call canonization of false facts, that the fact that people only report positive results doesn't just put a bit of wrong stuff out there in the literature, but if you take a cumulative view and you see you know, quite a few studies all supporting a particular idea that something is effective, you actually really think the finding is rock solid when in fact it may not be because you're just not seeing. And they did this little sort of uh, nice analysis 
where the beta is the power of the study, the alpha is the alpha as before. And they show, well, the experiment will either support or fail to support, depending on whether it really is true or not. But then what you have to add in because of publication bias is this additional probabilities that it will not see the light of day if it's negative. And that way you really can get very, very distorted literature. You see confirmation bias not just in what people decide to publish, but also in what literature they decide to take, pay attention to, remember and cite. And we just find it much easier to process and remember information that agrees with our viewpoint. Um, I love this uh, little thing I found on the internet, this uh, little man sitting looking at his computer. This is very like me, I realized. You know, you sort of get interested in somebody's sort of just written a paper saying perhaps that solvents are associated with autism in children, maternal exposure to solvents. And so you think, right, I shall go and look on the internet. And I don't think it works. So the first study I find that doesn't show that it works or shows it doesn't work, I'm, I sort of stop there. I don't look further. And we all do this all the time. We just is check things out until we find something that agrees with our belief and then we get jackpot. And you often do this quite unintentionally. We do it so naturally that it's hard to blame people for doing it. It's a very natural human failing. In fact, I love this quote, which I only found a week or two ago when I was, I was looking at Charles Darwin's autobiography. And it, it, Charles Darwin understood confirmation bias because he said that he had for many years followed a golden rule that whenever a published fact, a new observation or thought came across me, which was opposed to my general results, to make a memorandum of it without fail and at once. For I'd found by experience that such facts and thoughts were far more apt to escape from the memory than the favorable ones. So this is a good scientist. This is a guy who, instead of saying, well, I'm not going to look at that because it doesn't agree, actually makes a point of trying to make sure he writes it down and thinks about it and works out how, is, you know, how could he accommodate this finding in his theory, even though it seems inconvenient. And that is what most of us don't do, but it's the way we've got to train ourselves to think, to resist confirmation bias a lot of the time. Here's an instance of how, if you put together the publication bias with reporting bias, they actually conspire to mislead us really badly. And this was a study that was done by De Vries and colleagues who were able to actually quantify publication bias because what they're studying was um, efficacy of treatments in the case of depression, where the treatments had to be registered. So in clinical trials, there have been an attempts to overcome um, publication bias by requiring people who are funded to do a trial to register it so that even if it doesn't get published, you know it existed. And so what these authors did was go back to a registry and look at the studies from the registry um, and then you could, they could track them down and see how many were positive in green or negative in red. And they found that about half the negative trials were not reported. But it gets worse because they then found that even if they were reported, the authors often would be biased in how they reported them to emphasize anything that was in the data that was significant, even though it might not have been their primary outcome or their intended outcome. And then they would put some spin on it. Um, but then you've got citation bias. So you get to this point and there's lots and lots of studies that are um, positive studies that are, that are cited and the negative ones tend not to get cited, but uh, not to get reported and sorry, not to get published. You get to the citation point, even those negative studies that were actually reported get very seldom cited. The size of these circles reflects the number of citations. So you get this cumulative process whereby we ignore and we don't we not only don't publish but we also don't cite um, prominently things that don't agree with a positive effect and so we get this impression that we've got all these marvelously effective treatments when in fact we haven't so it and it's it's high stakes when it's things to do with uh, medical conditions for example but does any of this matter well um i obviously think it does but um I'm going to just try another little poll now with you because I want to sort of get a sense from people how seriously they regard a range of scientific behaviours. And the first is failing to publish. Um, I can't actually see what it says now because the poll has come up on top of it. But I think it's failing to publish a result that, uh, that disagrees with your hypothesis. Um, oh, it says it here. Yes, on the poll. Failing to publish data that doesn't fit. 
Um, so if people could think, how bad is that? Um, and at one end, we've got that you should go to prison if you do that. And at the other end, we've got, well, no, it doesn't really matter. But and obviously some things sort of in between. So what do people make of that? Right. Very good. OK, well, we've got a, We've got an ethical audience here who do think that uh, you should at least be retrained. And some people think you should be fired. Imprisonment seems to be regarded as a little bit too extreme for this. I'm going to have three others of these, all just asking basically the same question. So the next one is what about if you actually make up data? So you're, you don't you may not have any results at all. You just make stuff up. How bad is that if you're a scientist? Okay, so that is uh, worse, right? And some of you think they should actually go to prison. Um, let's try another one. You're writing the introduction to a research report and you cite three papers that support your hypothesis, but you knowingly omit from mention three that were well-conducted studies, but they didn't find the predicted effect. This happens a lot, but what do you think? How bad is that? <clears throat> Okay, so this is, most people think, yeah, you should be retrained. Um, and then last one. So you're writing the introduction to a research report and you state that a study found a significant effect supporting your position when you know that it found the opposite. Right, that's interesting. So some, again, this is, this is sort of generally thought to be more severe. So I'm pleased to say, I, I didn't sort of select this audience intentionally, but you are beautifully illustrating this business of what are known as asymmetric moral judgments, which basically boils down to saying, errors of commission uh, are worse than errors of omission. It's far worse to make up data than to fail to report data. And it's far worse to know to, to actually misrepresent um, what somebody's done rather than to just leave it out. And um, the point is that, in fact, those errors of omission are really serious in science. And I would argue that people tend to underestimate how serious they are. Um, obviously, what I've been showing you is that these graphs that illustrate just how massively they can distort our views of what's the, what is the case in terms of things like various treatments. Um, and I think there's a number of overlooked victims of problems of this kind. There's um, the potential users of research who may be patients um, or pol policy makers or whatever. Um, there's the funders who paid for the research um, who will have their research fundings used to perhaps propagate error rather than truth. And there's researchers who try and build on the results of people who went before them. And this last group, if I give talks in this area, often do then come back and say to me, um, well, yeah, I mean, that is exactly how my PhD went. I thought I had a good result um, that I could build on, that I, you know, a well-known phenomenon in the literature, only to find that um, I couldn't replicate it. And I spent three years trying to replicate it, thinking I was doing something wrong. And then I went to a conference and other people said, oh, yes, nobody can replicate that. And it was sometimes well known that it's not replicable. But very often these are effects that get into the textbooks and are thought to be solid precisely because we've only focused on the things that give these nice uh, results that look good. Will anything change? Um, the... There, a lot of people are very pessimistic and they're very pessimistic because these sorts of problems have been talked about for a very long time. In particular, low statistical power has been talked about since the 1970s. Jacob Cohen had a big push to get psychologists interested in power. Uh, in the clinical trials field, um, there have been statisticians banging on about it for a long time. Um, there is uh, 
people have known about publication bias since the 1960s and people have known about p hacking since the 1950s you know that these things have been written about and talked about and still they go on um and this book rigor mortis gives a, a very uh, impressive account of how in the biomedical sciences in uh, area and in pharma there's there's really really persistence of, of bad things that people know about and this guy bustin was was really uh, belaboring that point but i'm much more optimistic and i'm optimistic for a number of reasons one is that i think there is growing concern from people who use research to do something about this and there's concern from the funders as was evident from that academy of medical sciences meeting um, there's a great increase in studies just quantifying the problem, which we didn't have before. People used to write about these as theoretical uh, reasons why science might be affected, but now we have a better ways of actually showing in studies how big the problem is. Social media, I think, is really good for getting people talking about these things, and it's giving a voice to early career people. Because in the past, if you were concerned that a study might be doing something like uh, being subject to a, a large amount of bias, all that would happen is that you could get the option of perhaps writing a letter to the editor of a journal who may or may not decide to publish it months later. Um, these days, people can start talking about issues and, and papers that do do things like uh, that paper on solvents that I talked about and just present, um, you know, one result out of many, many, many and pretend it's significant. Then um, those sorts of studies get talked about and flagged up much more quickly than they used to be. But the other thing is that, um, which is what I'm particularly focused on, is that there's been a real growth in methods that counteract cognitive biases. And these include the use of data simulation, uh, things like systematic reviews to ensure that people do look at all the literature when they're doing a literature review, rather than just cherry picking out the ones that suit their position. And things like study registration, which really make a big difference if you, if you pre-register your research, um, then it's much harder. I mean, yes, I've got a slide. I wasn't, couldn't remember if I had this. This is a slide illustrating how you can really get rid of a lot of biases by moving from the classic publishing model where you plan a study, do a study, then submit it and get reviews and hopefully ultimately get it accepted by moving the order of things. And this is the model known as registered report, where what you submit to the journal is a protocol for your study, um, which uh, has an analysis plan and it has hypotheses and it has adequate power. Um, and you get reviews of that and you can revise it until your reviewers are happy, but only then do you do the study. And the advantage of that is that it um, actually gets rid of um, publication bias because the results don't determine whether it gets published or not. It's accepted in principle on the basis of the methods. Power is not, low power is not acceptable in this model. And you can't do p-hacking because you've said up front how you're going to analyze your data. And this harking is known as hypothesizing after results are known. And it's this sort of picking a hypothesis post hoc to match your data. You can't do that because you've stated your hypothesis in advance. So this is, a, I think, a very impressive new development that has really started to take off that will overcome some of these problems. But I'll stop there because I want to leave some time for questions and just leave you with various links that are useful for, um, I do have uh, my blog that was that uh, Morton Ann mentioned, which has quite a lot of material on it. Um, it. It's basically a blog about anything that I'm vaguely interested in, but a lot of it is about reproducibility issues and the catalog has it categorized that way. I've got quite a lot of slides dealing with these issues, including slides on how to simulate data on SlideShare. And uh, I wrote a paper that is a longer version of this talk um, for the Bartlett Prize. Interestingly enough, um, I was interested to hear that Morton Ann is the Bartlett Professor, Frederick Bartlett Professor. Well, this was the Bartlett Lecture. Um, and uh, it was very much on can we overcome some of these cognitive constraints to improve research. But thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dorothy, for providing such an informative presentation and uh, excuse me, thank you to the audience for joining us today. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Um, and um, I believe the way that, that, sh that we should proceed with the questions is through either the Q&A box or through chat. So uh, we will- Should I remove um, my slides at this point? Um, great.
Let's see, we have a question here. Oh. Question for Dorothy. Will the adoption rate for registered reports continue to climb until this model becomes the common means of journal publication? Or are there reasons the traditional model will continue to persist? Ah, that's a very good question. And of course, I'm not a clairvoyant. <laughs> I'm not entirely able to predict the future. I think it will continue. Um, I don't think it will take over completely. And it's not appropriate for all types of study. I think one of the things that it's revealed is that quite often people think they're doing hypothesis testing research when they're not. They don't really have a hypothesis. And because registered reports forces you to actually specify a hypothesis and an analysis plan, sometimes in my own group, we've thought, well, shall we do a registered report? And then we've realized, actually, no, we're just we're, we're at a pre-hypothesis stage where we, we need to do some exploratory studies where we just try and scope, scope out the landscape, if you like. And that's not suitable for a registered report. So I think that one thing they might force us to do is to make a much better distinction between what is hypothesis testing and what is exploratory. And we certainly do need a, a lot of exploratory research. And there's, there's one view that we perhaps rush too rapidly in some areas into formulating hypotheses before we've really scoped out the territory. But having said that, I think they're popular because um, they are hard to do. They're much harder than people imagine because you really do have to think things through, but it's enormously satisfying. So I try to do registered reports where possible, where I have got a hypothesis. Um, and you feel you're doing proper science in a way that um, you, I didn't used to so much because you, um, you do have to think things through. You have to have very clear ideas. You think through your analysis, often with simulated data. And then the other huge advantage of registered reports is you get the referee feedback at a point in time when it's actually useful. And reviewers are often um, very constructive uh, in a way that they might not be if you present them with a you know, fully fledged piece of work and then they think, well, if I was doing it, I would have done that, but they can't actually have any impact on it. When they are making suggestions about a, a protocol which you haven't yet run, they often are enormously helpful. So I think it leads to much, much better research. But I think that not everybody's going to do it all the time, but it's going to become more available and it's going to be, I think, a, sig a signal of, of high quality work when uh, the people will, just like now, people you know, all want to publish in the sort of top journals. I think that's going to fade away and there'll be much more of an emphasis on was it a registered report uh, as an indicator of quality. Thank you. And a related question from Richard Ball, pre-registration and registered reports are in principle compelling ways to address the problems you've talked about, but are there limitations? Does it tie researchers' hands too much in particular? What are researchers who you use observational data rather than experimental data, um, such as, <coughs> excuse me, social psychologists uh, and economists? Yeah, I mean, I think there, again, you have to, th it, what it forces you to do, I mean, I think it's worth thinking about, could I do a registered report? Because what it forces you to do is really mm -hmm. recognize what it is you're testing, or are you exploring? And, and you know, do you have a clear hypothesis? And uh, there will be certainly situations where um, it may not be feasible. Having said that, I mean, you don't always have to, I, th I think you can do registered reports with pre-existing data sets where you may already have a clear hypothesis. Um, and I did one where I, you know, you have to be careful because they allow you to cheat in effect. If, the data, if, you're, if you've got an existing data set, you could perhaps have a sneak look at it and then say, oh, I formulated a hypothesis, which would be classic hypothesizing <laughs> after results are known. But I, I, if you can find ways to get around that. Um, I did one study where we had genetic data and we had behavioral data, but we didn't put the two together. And the journal allowed us to register predictions about the genetic relationship with the actual behavioral data because we made it, you know, we sort of basically mm -hmm. promised that we hadn't peaked. And indeed, I wouldn't have understood the genetics data and the geneticists wouldn't have understood the behavioral data. So we had to spend a lot of time working out what our predictions were and they all failed to come out. So mm -hmm. uh, I think people didn't think we were cheating because we got null results mm -hmm. anyway. But um, you can do it in situations like that. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and I can tell you from my lab, we have started at least documenting, even though it's not technically a pre-registration, documenting when we are intending to do a purely exploratory research, just so that we don't come back later and, you know, yeah. um, and, and, and fool ourselves, as yes. Richard Feynman would say. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, so, that's, that's, that's the thing. Yeah. People do and, just, and Chris Chambers was making the same point that when he said when he started pre-registering studies, he couldn't believe what he had pre-registered because once he'd seen the data, he had completely different views about what it all meant. Yeah. And he, he, he was sort of kicking himself as thinking, did I really predict that? And yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and yeah. Um, I, I, I will take liberty as a moderator to ask a question, Dorothy. Um, I think what's marvelous about your approach is that you force us back to these cognitive biases, that mm. it's not just people being nefarious yeah. um, or, um, I mean, there are people who are doing that, but you know, yeah, the road is not that people are being nefarious. It's that we have these, um, you know, we could just call them inborn biases um, yeah. about confirmation bias. And that's like most biases and heuristics, those probably serve us well in other contexts, but they're not serving us well here. And I'm wondering if, you've also thought about um, interventions for these biases mm. and whether that might be a successful approach. We do know that, for example, in gender biases, interventions and, and for um, other um, quote unquote implicit biases about um, race and ethnicity, some of the interventions haven't been so successful. Yeah. But I wonder if we could, for example, in terms of just better training in terms of probability values or better training mm -hmm. in terms of the big, the biggie, which I think is going to be the difficult one, confirmation bias. Yes. That yes, we can fool ourselves and it's very easy to fool ourselves because we want to be right. That's just yeah. the way yeah. the world works. And I think, I think, I don't think you'll ever get rid of it entirely, but I think, you know, we should be think, training people to think like Darwin, you know, I think it's that sort of training and training people also perhaps not only to f stop ignoring things they don't like, but also stop being so, you know, ready to grasp at anything that looks right. So another colleague of mine, uh, Jonathan Flint, wrote a very nice book on, on genetics and with, with some of his colleagues. And he described how in his lab, you know, these people, these geneticists, they look and look and try and find some association. A lot of it is very, very dull and boring that nothing comes up. And then one of his students had come up with something. And Jonathan, who's a good scientist, immediately said, okay, you've probably done something wrong <laughs> in order to yeah, get this yeah, result. Yeah. He's how, you know, a student is really cross and saying, you know, I spent years and years and now you're telling me it's probably wrong. But it was sort of like, look carefully, not just at the things yeah. that, um, you know, look critically, not just at the things you don't like, but look critically when the results come out like you might have expected and be aware that this could also, you, you've got to just shore everything up but I think that that is going to come from training. Um, but of course, it's also otherwise, it is the role that your referees are supposed to be fulfilling is to look at it dispassionately without your biases. They might not love your theory. And so much as many of us hate having mm -hmm. negative reviewers, that is part of what the process has to be about. It's, it's stopping you from just getting carried away with your own idea and confronting somebody else who knows the area, but who isn't as wedded to that idea as you. Right, so a built-in devil's advocate, so yes. to speak, that we, yes. <laughs> that we often, and maybe even training ourselves, as you showed that Darwin has done, training ourselves to, at, uh, to, to pose those positions um, yes. our, as devil's advocate to ourselves or yes. in our lab group or the like, so that we yeah. can begin to see a much you know, broader perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think it does mean that, I mean, sometimes I think science, uh, well, it's a, it's a funny old business because it's highly competitive, um, but sometimes it's almost too cozy that people get worried about being combative and, and sort of, you know, you know, in Q&As after talks and things and people complain and say, oh, you know, somebody was very negative about my talk. But I think that is a situation where really 
you know, if you can do it without making it personal and being nasty, but where other people should be looking at what you're saying and trying to pick holes in it, because that's the way science progresses. But what we haven't somehow got to is a way of um, doing that without it getting very personal and unpleasant for people. And so perhaps also the social psychologists need to come in and try and invent some ways that we can do this in a much less threatening way. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it's just, again, it's accepting that this is not... Um, you know this isn't devastating it's, it's not part of normal science if somebody you know mm -hmm. tries to find something wrong with what you're doing it's what they should be doing not that they're a nasty person or out to get you mm -hmm. and re in reframing it that way yes so i see that we are right at the hour and so my mm -hmm. job as a good moderator is to keep us on time so i want to thank you again dorothy for providing um the presentation thank the audience for attending and um i need to give a buzz uh for the next week's um seminar a webinar which will be lars uh, Will Hubert's presentation titled replication reproducibility in social sciences and statistics context concerns and co concrete measures so i hope everyone will be able to join again and thank you again for your presentation and participation today thank you very much i've really enjoyed it thanks excellent